This time on Motor Week 91, we'll drive a hot little pickup truck from GMC, the Cyclone. Lisa Barrow brings us up to date on airbags. We'll see how the members of our long-term test fleet are holding up. And Craig Singha shows us where to learn stock car racing. So come drive with us next. Motor Week 91, television's automotive magazine, is made possible by the financial support of public television viewers like you. Your host from Motor Week 91, John Davis. Well, hello and welcome again to Motor Week 91. We're glad to have you with us. There was a time that no one would have ever thought to put the words sports and truck together. But nowadays, sports truck describes a wide variety of factory and aftermarket variations on the basic pickup truck idea. Of course, many of those changes are aimed at improving the truck's looks, not its performance. That is, until now. This is the GMC Cyclone, and that's Cyclone with an S. It's based on the Sonoma Compact Pickup. But don't make the mistake of thinking that this is just another workhorse with a facelift. The Cyclone's differences go deep, making it one of the first factory-built ultra high performance trucks that you can legally drive on the street. Look at the GMC Cyclone and you may at first see just another jazzed up sinister pickup. It has all the features popular with today's urban cowboys. Features like a monochrome black paint scheme, the only color available. A deep front air dam with integral fog lamps. The chassis has been lowered and then there's the pavement hugging ground effects package and 16 inch alloy wheels. But those wheels are wearing low-profile Firestone Firehawk tires, hardly normal for a truck, but necessary when you've got a 4.3-liter turbocharged V6 under the hood. This heavily massaged version of one of GMC's standard truck motors makes 280 horsepower and 350 pound-feet of torque. All that torque feeds through a four-speed automatic transmission and into a full-time four-wheel drive system adapted from GM's rear-drive minivans. In this case, four-wheel drive is needed to get the power quickly to the pavement. The result is a truck that will outrun most high-performance cars with a 0-60 to 60 time of 5.4 seconds on a 90-degree day. On cooler days, under 5 seconds is very possible. At the drag strip, the quarter mile also flies by in 14.1 seconds at 98 miles per hour. A Corvette ZR1 does only slightly better. The Cyclone's initial launch is fairly strong, but then the turbo kicks in around 3,000 RPMs and nails you to your seat with a tremendous rush of power. The transmission's crisp shifts are set relatively low, around 4,200 RPMs, to make the most of the engine's substantial torque. Sport truck this may be, but get hard into a quarter and you quickly realize that the Cyclone is still a truck albeit one that will outhandle any other production truck on the road. The feel is very neutral on turn-in, but front plow increases heavily as you near the limits of traction. There is some rear axle hop in sharp corners, yet emergency maneuvers are the most trouble-free that we've ever experienced in a truck. Bringing the Cyclone down from speed are front disc and rear drums. They're all ABS equipped and stopped our test truck from 60 in a short average distance of 116 feet. Stops were generally straight, but again the light rear end tended to hop a bit. There was also some fade after several hard stops, though there was still more than enough braking power left for any street situation. Out on public roads, the Cyclone has a very firm but compliant ride, and potholes and expansion joints quickly remind you how stiffly sprung the lowered Cyclone really is. Like all of GM's 4.3 V6 variants to date, idle is rough, and engine noise at highway speeds is on the high side. Expectedly, fuel economy is not a Cyclone high point. Mileage is EPA rated at 14 city, 17 highway. Our mixed test loop returns 16 miles per gallon. But the big number to some is the price, $25,500. While a lot of money for a small truck, you can't buy more high performance for less. And you do also get a very un-truck-like sport interior. 
It includes everything from a leather-wrapped steering wheel to a full set of power accessories. The dash is mostly standard S15 pickup, clean and well-organized, without the spread-out control placement found in many import pickups. And we've never seen any pickup with a more comprehensive gauge package. Adapted from a Pontiac Sunbird GT, there's everything from a voltmeter to a turbo boost gauge, and they're all large and easy to read. The cloth-covered bucket seats look sporty and comfortable, but they're very firm, too firm, and a little tight. Adjustments are basic, but include an inflatable lumbar support. The standard AM-FM cassette stereo is set high enough for easy use and features clean, well-marked controls. The heat and ventilation controls are also simple to use. Air conditioning is standard. And in case that you ever forget that this is a street truck, a label has been placed in the cab as a reminder. The standard cab means minimal inside cargo space, so interior storage has been maximized whenever possible. A six-foot cargo bed offers plenty of easy-to-load cargo space, but only a 500-pound capacity. A soft sliding tonneau cover with snaps is standard equipment. It's handsome and aids in cyclone aerodynamics. Summing up this windy GMC sport truck, our hits start with the Cyclone's rapid but surprisingly civilized acceleration delivered by its turbocharged V6 engine. We also like the dark styling, tight handling, sporty interior, and long list of standard features. Misses include the engine's rough idle and noisy cruise, hard tight seats, and marginal payload weight capacity. After all, it is still a truck. Normally at this point in our road test, we would compare the Cyclone to its competition. But the GMC Cyclone has no competition. Not in price or performance. That will hold true until GMC unleashes the Cyclone's evil twin this fall. To be called Typhoon, it'll be an S15 Jimmy Sport utility with the same turbo V6 treatment. GMC is clearly out to carve a high performance niche for its light trucks and end any confusion with its bigger brother Chevrolet. We can't think of any better way to do that than with vehicles like the Cyclone. The Cyclone is one of the most impractical rides on the planet, but it's also one that will be wind burned in our memories for a long time to come. Of all the subjects that Lisa Barrow covers, auto safety is the most important. It's also the automotive subject that most people know the least about. So Lisa assembles periodic updates to keep you informed. Here she is with her latest FYI safety report. All right. Ready? I'm ready. Woo! A couple of years ago, I gave you my impression of what it was like to experience an airbag deployment. Today, over 3.9 million cars in the U.S. are equipped with these safety devices. But even with so many airbags in use, a recent study conducted by Lou Harrison Associates reveals that many people still have a lot of misconceptions about airbags. Well, airbags are designed to inflate in funnel crashes only. And in funnel crashes only above a certain severity of crash. And we call that the threshold. And basically, uh, the threshold in the GM system is around uh, 12 miles per hour. Uh, basically, when a crash occurs, uh, the uh, funnel crash, the sensor uh, triggers and uh, sends an electrical signal to the inflator that uh, generates the gas and blows up the cushion which comes out of the steering wheel. It's quicker than the blink of an eye and it's very loud. So loud in fact that studies were conducted to measure impact on the occupant's hearing after airbag deployment. But the findings prove only minimal, short-lived impact on hearing. No worse than after an evening at a rock concert. There's no chance that the airbag will trap or suffocate you because it inflates in the crash but then begins to deflate immediately and the airbag is made of like a woven nylon type material so even if you held that material right up against your face it's not going to suffocate you. The bag inflates with harmless nitrogen gas but some have raised questions over the toxic chemical that triggers the airbag inflation. According to the experts at General Motors, sodium azide in its pure form is considered a hazardous substance. That's why in the airbag system, it's sealed inside a metal canister like this, and it's activated only in the event of a crash. And any chemicals that are released are present in such small amounts that they should not be harmful. Airbag systems are subjected to extreme conditions, and because of the way they are engineered, there is virtually no chance of them going off when they are not needed. Airbags should cost about $320 a piece. 
And once an airbag is used, it has to be replaced, and that can cost three times as much as the original. A few airbag systems need maintenance, and warranty coverage on these devices ranges from two to six years, depending upon the manufacturer. During my experience with airbags, my hearing was initially affected, but only for a few seconds. And while the airbag startled me, it deflated so quickly that if it were to go off unexpectedly, I felt it would be easy to maintain control of the car. And don't worry about the smoke. It's only cornstarch. It prevents the airbag from sticking to itself during deployment. And of course, in the real world, vehicles get in all kinds of crashes. And uh, an airbag won't inflate, for example, in a side impact or a rear impact. And therefore, you need lap shoulder belts for that. More and more auto companies are installing driver and passenger side airbags as standard equipment. Chrysler already has driver side airbags in all U.S. made cars. Other manufacturers are rapidly following suit. And while these safety devices are effective only in frontal crashes, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, frontal crashes are the leading cause of injury and death in motor vehicles. An airbag, used in conjunction with the lap shoulder belt, can reduce your chances of dying in such a collision by 45 to 55 percent. There are plenty of books available about buying a new car, and many are very useful. But if paging through reams of auto information bores you, then you might want to look at a video called The Smart Buyer's Guide to Purchasing a New Car. It uses dramatization to illustrate the pitfalls of new car buying and some of the car dealer's favorite tactics. While not the definitive work on the subject, it does offer plenty of sound advice that every prospective car buyer can use. If we have an automotive problem, we go to Pat Goss. But there's a lot more to Pat's skills than just fixing a starting problem or giving advice on oil changes. Occasionally, Pat likes a project that he can really sink his teeth into. So for the next five weeks, Pat won't be fixing cars, he'll be building one. John, I think all of us who like cars have thought about building a car of our own. I know I have. So we've come here to Maxton Components in Denver, Colorado to learn more about the car that we'd like to build. And we're going to meet Dan Ripley. He's the person that manufactures the components for this car, the Maxton Roller Skate. The Maxton Roller Skate is a component car. It comes as a box of components that the buyer assembles in his or her garage. The intent of the Maxton is to recreate the driving experience of the car's produced during the heyday of the sports car era. The Maxton roller skate, uh, we will be able to deliver FOB Denver for less than $20,000, but that's without an engine. What is included in the kit? Every single item that you'd need to put the car together. The wheels, the tires, the interior, the seats, uh, the roll bar, the body, the instrumentation, the uh, wiring harness, uh, the fuel tank, uh, fuel lines, the complete suspension. Again, everything but the engine. The average individual with no experience should be able to put it together in less than 50 hours. How is this different from other kit cars? Well, we make not only the body, but the chassis, the suspension, everything in the car is made from the ground up to fit specifically the Maxton. Thanks, Jeff. This is our fixture table, Pat, and you'll see now where the pieces go in on the jigging. JP. Pat, this step is very critical because it ensures the correct alignment of the frame on the jig before the welding actually starts. Pat, the pre-assembled chassis includes the steering rack, brake lines, fuel lines, wiring harness, and even the fuel tank already installed. This is where we rebuild the Mazda gearbox and differential. The seals, bearings, and gaskets are all replaced before they go with the kit to the individual end user.
Even though our prototype has an engine in it for test purposes, you know we can't actually install the engine or furnish an engine with a kit. Would you like to try this one on? I sure would. We took the Maxton prototype to Mountain View Motor Sport Park, just north of Denver, where I donned my helmet and learned a little bit about how the roller skate feels. The chassis is designed to accept a Mazda rotary engine, something that's easy to find in a wrecking yard. With an engine that's designed to pull a much heavier car, the 1,700-pound roller skate sure can accelerate. And despite that distinctive rotary engine buzz, I think most sports car fans will appreciate how this car pleases your senses. It reminds you of an old British roadster. We're out of time for now, but you're going to be seeing a lot more of the Maxton roller skate, because next week we start to build one of our very own. So be sure to watch us. If you have a question about the Maxton roller skate or any car, write to me. If I use your letter on the air, I'll send you a MotorWeek t-shirt. The address is MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That's MotorWeek, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. It will be interesting to see how the Maxton goes together. But right now, it's time to see how some other cars are holding together. Those that make up our long-term test fleet. The newest of which is this Plymouth Acclaim. The Acclaim seems nearly perfect as a family sedan for a more socially conscious decade. It doesn't brag about its large interior, ample power, solid feel, or respectable fuel economy. It just delivers, and so far, without complaint. After a quick 6,200 miles in just over two months, fuel use stands at 23 miles per gallon. That's right on target for a car with EPA ratings of 18 city and 26 highway. Being so new, we wouldn't expect any repairs beyond a couple of oil and filter changes. Add that in, and our total operating costs are 6.3 cents per mile. Now, with gas prices back down to earth, between 6 and 7 cents is normal for a car. We should note that this Acclaim has the Chrysler 4-speed automatic transmission that one consumer publication recently labeled a lemon. Our car's transmission works fine as have half a dozen other test cars we've tried over the last two and a half years that use the same gearbox. We'll let you know if this one sours, but right now it shifts in the paint. Doing yeoman's duty is this Chevrolet Lumina APV minivan. It has exceeded our original long-term goal with 32,000 miles on its odometer. Mileage is dropping a bit, but a total test average of 21 is still two miles per gallon above our original road test loop. The APV's total operating cost of 6.8 cents per mile is fine for any truck-based model. We've had no problems with the APV recently, and it took to this winter's cold weather by starting quickly and going surely. So did our Ford Explorer. But to be fair, we didn't have enough snow this season to really tax its on-road slushing abilities. Total test mileage is down three-tenths from last report to 17 miles per gallon. Thus, operating expenses rose slightly to 8.2 cents per mile. That's high for a car, but not for a four-wheel drive truck. We told you a few months ago about the ignition switch that felt vague and left you hunting for the off position. Now the switch is so worn that the key can be taken out while the engine is running. Mazda has a modified version of the lock on their Explorer knockoff, the Navajo. It works better. But we come up short when looking for other things to improve on the Explorer. Our staff especially likes the fact that the full-size spare tire is located under the chassis and not on a cumbersome swing-out door like so many other 4x4 wagons. Our other four-wheel drive model is more for go than snow, but it still goes just fine in rough weather. 
there are few cars on the market for any price that feel as secure and provide the driver with as much confidence as the Mitsubishi Eclipse GSX. With 11,400 miles under its turbocharged belt, the car is wearing well. The only sign of age we've noticed is a shifter that is harder to put into reverse than when new. Mileage is good for such a high-performance machine at 22, up four-tenths of a mile per gallon from our last report. Total test cost remains normal at 6.6 .6 cents per mile. That's the only thing that's normal about the Eclipse GSX, that is, besides the name of the town in Illinois where it is made. We'll be back to check in on our long-term fleet a month from now and see if anything passes for normalcy then. Our car of the week is a 1935 Rover 14 Sports Saloon. It's just been restored by Cedric Bell of Penticton, British Columbia. If you have a car that you put a lot of work into and would like to show off, we'll consider it for Car of the Week. Just send a good color photo and a self-addressed return envelope to Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. And now for something a little more recent, here's Lisa Barrow with the latest motor news. We reported before, John, that Ford of Europe is building a world car which will replace both the European Sierra Line and America's Ford Tempo and Mercury Topaz. Well, this is that car. But recent reports indicate that it won't be quite the international model that Ford had originally planned it to be. The basic platform will appear on both sides of the Atlantic, but mechanical differences will be many. American cars will probably be powered by an improved version of the current 2.3-liter four-cylinder or an optional 3-liter V6 taken from the Taurus and Sable. Europeans will get everything from a turbo diesel to a Porsche-developed V6. Europeans will also get a full line of body styles, ranging from a high-performance coupe to a station wagon. Americans will only see a four-door sedan. The new front-drive platform is longer and wider than the current car. While these photos are of the European styling model, we can expect the same basic look to make it to this country. The new Tempo and Topaz will probably make their debut in early 1993, at the same time as their European counterparts. For something more homegrown, we have an upcoming model from Cadillac. The 1992 Seville has already made a big splash with the automotive press, and this new Eldorado should be equally well received. Its lean styling and Elante-like front end conceal the same front-drive platform that's found under the Seville. And like the Seville, the longer, wider Eldorado will use Cadillac's current 4.9-liter V8 engine until the 32-valve North Star V8 is available. The Eldorado and Seville are set for a 1992 debut, John, and both promise better days for GM's top luxury car division. Thanks, Lisa. At one time or another, every automotive enthusiast dreams of becoming a race car driver. Craig Singhaus is no exception, so he's always looking for interesting racing schools. This time he's found one that not only teaches you the basics of one of America's most exciting forms of racing, but offers you the opportunity to learn from a legend. A doctor, an administrative assistant, a stunt woman, a police officer, just four of the people from a group that share a dream of driving Winston Cup stock cars. And they all turned to one man to learn, the legendary Buck Baker. Buck Baker learned stock car racing the hard way, on both short tracks and the super speedways, winning the 1956 and 57 NASCAR championship, as well as hundreds of races all across the country. Today he runs the Buck Baker Driving School with the same kind of grit and toughness that won him hundreds of races. Hey, the way is this son going? You see, this is no automotive tea party for the faint of heart. It's my my style of training. I, I've got a, a a way of of communicating that a lot of people they, they get a little upset occasionally because I jump down their throat, you know. But the thing is that I didn't come here necessarily to make friends with you. I come here to teach you to drive a race car. And teach he does, starting with the skid car that shows students how to recover from a 180 degree skid. A good habit to get into, those of you that plan to do some racing. And there is, of course, some basic classroom instruction. But the real classroom is either Atlanta, Georgia's, or North Carolina Motor Speedway's high-banked oval. 
Here, students learn the line from the likes of Buck's illustrious son, Buddy Baker. As a general rule, they, they catch on quite fast, and, uh, you know, they're a lot of fun to work with. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been involved in anything that I enjoy any more than teaching people who drive race cars. I'm a professional stunt driver, and I thought I'd come out to take the course to broaden my horizon on racing. I've never driven a stock car, and I thought it'd be a great experience. The different variety of people are that they walk of life. You have doctors, uh, uh, pilots, uh, uh, people that own their own corporations, and and then you have some guy that can just scrape up fifteen hundred dollars and get a chance to come to the school. The class was a gift from my boss. It was a once in a lifetime deal. It's not something I would have, you know, decided to do on my own. But I'm really having a good time, and I'm glad I came. I usually race sports cars, and um, I'm here at this school to find out the difference in the racing and that's a big challenge it's being as different as it is uh, you just kind of got to forget everything that you've learned in that school and go to this school and put it all together the equipment the Baker school uses is first rate and receives excellent maintenance and support yeah they're real race cars they're, they're gonna be just like the 87 and the 44 car that we do our advanced training here with uh, they would qualify here for a race if there is one drawback to the Baker School, it's that it's a victim of its own popularity. It's best to enroll in a class that isn't overly crowded. Still, large class or small, you can rest assured that the man in the flag stand keeps everybody in line. What is this guy in that made it six that drive there? The thing is, if I can get through you, to you and teach you how to drive a race car, you can decide and you get ready to go whether you like me or not. If you do, well, then that's fine. If you don't, well, then if I taught you to drive a race car, it's still fine. No, she did good, sir. Join us next week for another new car road test. We'll also look at a full-size Ford pickup. Pat Goss will continue his series on building a component car. Lisa Barrow will show us some new automotive products. Well, Craig Singhaus looks at a German supercar. I'm John Davis. We'll see you then. Motor Week 91 is made possible by the financial support of public television viewers like you. If you'd like a transcript of this program, send $4 to Motor Week Transcripts, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Residents of Maryland at 20 cents sales tax. Ask for show number 1041. is a production of Maryland Public Television. This is PBS.